a big welcome to this Imagine Festival on the Ulster Workers' Council strike of May 1974, 50 years on. Um, when I was asked to bring this together, I have to own up and say I wasn't quite sure whether it could be done or indeed whether it was the right thing to do. In May 2014, I um, organized the last major conference on the UWC strike, which took place at Queen's University with speakers including Glenn Barr, Austin Curry, Ken Bloomfield, Morris Hayes, Nell McCafferty, and Adrian Dunbar. And I'm struck by the caliber of those political names and the loss of several, uh, Glennie Barr, Morris, uh, Austin, uh, the teacher and writer Henry Sinatron as well. It reminds us of the march of time, memory recedes, people fall away. And it remiss remains essential, therefore, to bring those who are still with us and who were there together. But I also thought more broadly about this event today and the context of our present, even back in November when I was chatting with Pete O'Neill about this, the Northern Ireland Assembly, many of you will recall, was not functioning, and I wasn't completely sure how useful it was to focus on an event so associated with political dysfunction and collapse. As many of you will know, the UWC strike is often evoked by hardline unionists and loyalists as an example, a threat to political structures that the Protestant working class has in its historical locker. Even if such an action might not occur, the threat is always there. I'm going to provide some historical context as well, because I know from my students that um, a lot of young people especially don't know the, necessarily the full history of it, so I think it's useful to provide that. And I think it's fair to say that the UWC is a key and um, perhaps also the most, one of the most poorly understood events of the Troubles a complex mis mix of working class mass mobilization and loyalist paramilitarism. It was the most successful industrial stoppage by any working class in Europe since the Second World War. And it came from one of the continent's most apparently reactionary groups, Ulster Protestants. The strike is bound up in struggles within unionism. Uh, following the reforming tenure of Terence O'Neill and Chichester Clark briefly, Brian Faulkner assumed the helm in 1971. Though Faulkner had been a unionist hardliner himself, he was an outsider within a social elite, Dublin educated. And uh, after elections in 1973, he agreed to lead Northern Ireland's first ever power sharing executive, um, featuring members of his own unionist party, the Nationalist, Social Democratic and Labour Party and Alliance. The problem was many loyalists and unionists were incensed by the Sunningdale's creation of the Council of Ireland, which gave the Irish government a consultative role in Northern Affairs. In the February 1974 Westminster election, uh, 11 out of 12 anti-Sunningdale candidates were returned. The timing of that election has always been key. And Ted Heath's Conservative Party, who had negotiated the accord, were uh, replaced by Harold Wilson's Labour Party. With the executive now functioning day to day, the UWC chose a date to begin. 14th of May 1974 and on this day that first day the strike actually appeared a total washout absenteeism was estimated less than five percent and then mainly confined to the Lagan Valley engineering works however a key asset of the UWC, the UWC an East Belfast power worker named Billy Kelly was about to start shutting down Northern Ireland's electricity grid Kelly was a Pentecostalist who believed it was later reported that he could apply biblical verses to the strike, in particular passages from the books of Daniel, Thessalonians and Revelations, which contained themes of transient regimes and earthly regimes and the fear of God. Kelly convinced colleagues at Bally Lumford, where 70% of the province's electricity was generated, to reduce power supplies to a third of capacity, maintaining key services but not industry. Derry, London Derry was particularly badly hit with the city's power supply reduced to a quarter. On the second day, lighting is now flickering. Loyalist paramilitaries get into gear when several thousand workers at Harlan and Wolf shipyard were called to a meeting and told that any vehicles left in the car park after lunchtime would be burnt. There were similar scenes at Mackey's and Taroko. Buses and light lorries were hijacked and transport ground to a halt, while Larne, Northern Ireland's second biggest port, was sealed off and sh all shipping halted. Petrol distribution fell into the hands of the strike committee and paramilitaries arranged for the delivery of essential foodstuffs, creating in certain parts of the city what some saw as a blitz spirit. 
things, as many people will remember, were different in other parts of the city. A Catholic civil servant, Patrick Shea, described the atmosphere, even in leafy South Belfast, as frightening and raw Nazism. Not only was intimidation rife, two middle-aged Catholic brothers were shot dead by the UDA when they refused to close their family pub just outside Ballymena. On the 17th of May, a series of UVF car bombs ripped through the centre of Dublin at the beginning of rush hour, uh, then in Monaghan an hour and a half later, leading to the eventual loss of 33 lives. In a moment of high political theatre, people also remember Howard Wilson took to the screens on Saturday the 25th of May to deliver what became known as the Sponges broadcast. Loyalists were expecting the Prime Minister to intern them. Instead, he railed against people who spend their lives sponging on Westminster and British democracy. Who do these people think they are? Whatever the reason for Wilson's intervention, its effect was to swing any waivers in the Protestant community behind the strike. Ben Barr joked that Wilson would be made an honorary member of the UDA for this. Three days later, uh, after Wilson's broadcast, Faulkner and the other five unionist ministers resigned, coll collapsing the executive. By the end, uh, the, the paralysis is such that Faulkner had to be transported into Stormont by helicopter. Tractors from loyalist sympathising farmers paved the Newton Arts Road. Faulkner opened his memoirs recalling the scene with the chapter title of Carson's Ghost. I have to declare my own skin in the game here. Uh, at this point, my uh, grandfather, uh, the large chap on the left, was uh, Paddy Devlin, Minister for Health and Social Services in the Sunningdale Power Sharing Executive. A teenage IRA internee, Paddy was released in 1945 and soon joined the Northern Ireland Labour Party, which was a clear decision becoming a part of the labour movement as opposed to other kinds of movements. He joined the Woodvale branch of the Northern Ireland Labour Party and it was Protestants from the Shankill area who brought him into it. During May 1974, the story I have to tell is that in his ministerial car, Paddy raced through the roadblocks and streets up to the Shankill to give his old friend Billy Hewitt a bottle of brandy for his birthday. Some of you will know of the um, Hewitt uh, family and Billy and Billy's son Jackie who manages the Farset complex on the Springfield Road interface, and the Hewitts are a family who were close with ours. Um, this kind of old working class bonding later extended to pa Paddy's relationship with Glenn Barr, who was the essential de facto leader of the stoppage in 1974, and who revealed at the conference a decade ago that such was their good relations after seven, 1974, he signed Paddy's nomination papers for the 1979 European election. That lot of good it did him uh, was what um, Glenny joked at the time. We have to remember these episodes within and after the strike because in our simple green and orange narratives, this kind of history is now forgotten or ignored. There are other stories as well. I hope to hear some more of them today. Uh, in a famous moment during May 1974, my granddad made the executive decision to dispense unemployment benefit, which sustained the strike in loyalist areas. This essentially meant that the British taxpayer ends up subsidizing the UWC strike. But it's also something that loyalists remember to the present day. They knew thereafter that Catholics in government was not necessarily paying for them. In another, another case, during a North-South meeting, Irish Minister for Foreign Affairs, Gareth Fitzgerald, launched into a typically visionary outline of the Council of Ireland with wide-ranging responsibilities. Gareth, Paddy said, you may keep your hands off my fucking ambulances for a start. In all serious, there's also sadness in the story, uh, this was the peak of Paddy's political career, and it lasted five months. Uh, there's a long-standing view in the SDLP that even though John Hume goes on to success and Good Friday, they never really recover from the fall of Sunningdale. And there's something in that, as one of our panelists uh, says, uh, Sunningdale's perhaps the great lost opportunity of all. Uh, to some hints to historians, myself ex included, stepping out of my family history, May 1974 is not so much the famous Protestant backlash, but the, large, the last gasp of Protestant working class muscle and political power, the final flexing of that Protestant working class spirit from the base that once held Northern Ireland as it once was together and in place. Uh, it was arguably a class conscious action directed as much against the landed gentry and local business tycoons as uh, who had dominated the Unionist Party as against an overextending Irish government and uh, uh, the, um, who were keen on a united Ireland. 
It stopped the winning that many unionist felt Catholics had enjoyed since 1968, and it confirmed the politics of destruction. Things could be wrecked, but never really built. It is for many in Northern Ireland an event we are still wrestling with. So I'm going to hand over now and introduce our panelists and ask them a few um, questions. Um, first up, we have Dawn Purvis, who many of you will know. Uh, Dawn represented East Belfast during the 2007 to 2011 Northern Ireland Assembly as a leader of the Progressive Unionist Party and then as an independent. During this time, she was involved in significant work around Protestant working class educational underachievement, including the report A Call to, to Action, still one of the most essential reports about the subject to ever be released. She was involved in the Good Friday negotiations, agreement negotiations, and I have to say I was talking to um, an old friend uh, last week who was recalling some of her interventions then. We were talking by phone, and the man who's about 90 years old now, so he's kind of getting on in terms of his grasp of names, and said, that was down to great work by Dawn, Dawn, Dawn. And before I could interject and say Purvis, he said, Dawn French. Thankfully, Dawn French was not, in fact, uh, advising the Progressive Unionist Party during mid-1990s. It was, in fact, Dawn Purvis, who was working with one of her mentors, the late and much-missed Davy Irvin. After leaving politics, Dawn became Northern Ireland Programme Director of Mary Stubbs International and worked as an independent consultant in different international countries where she supported peace programmes, championing the inclusion of women in politics and civil society. She continues to serve as a trustee for various organisations and charities who work to tackle disadvantage, socioeconomic, and exclusion. Dawn, big welcome to today. Um, I just wondered if you could tell us some of your memories about what was going on during May 1974. Where were you? What did you see? Well, I wasn't a commander in the UVF at the time. At, at eight years of age, I doubt if I'd held office in anything. Um, I know you're all saying, I didn't think she was that age, but yeah, I was, I was about eight, eight years old. And I remember, I remember the strike quite clearly. Uh, and I recall it quite clearly because I wrote a play uh, about 24 hours during the Ulster Workers' Council strike uh, in, uh, to, to mark the 40th anniversary of the strike. Martin Lynch invited me to, to write one and it was shown in the, in the Opera House under a trio of plays called Flesh and Blood Women. Um, and it really looked at uh, the issues that women faced during the Ulster Workers' Council strike because I don't think that has been explored nor made public in all of the reflections on, on the Ulster Workers' Council strike. Um, as, a, as an eight-year-old child, um, there were three children in the family. My mum was a single parent. Uh, she, she worked on the Antrim Road in a greengrocer's and sent us to school every day. We were looked after by my grandmother when she came, when, whenever we returned from school. And so when the strike started, mum continued to work and mum continued to, to send us to school. And uh, I suppose us at the time were going, why do we have to go to school when everybody else isn't going to school? Why is mum having to go to work when every else, everyone else isn't going to work? And mum said quite clearly that she needed to work in order to earn money, in order to, to feed us. And she didn't have the option of not, not going to work. And about four or five days into the strike, mum got a knock at the door from, from one of the, the dominant women in the community, um, telling her that she had not to go to work the next day. She had not to send the children to school the next day. And she said, how am I going to feed my children? And they said, we don't care. But if you go to work and your children go to school, you'll have no house to come home to. So mum then couldn't go to work and couldn't send us to school. And she had no means of, of feeding us um, apart from one neighbour in the street. Um, she had a family of four and they they shared what they could in order in order to feed us. We, of course, had no inkling at the time. We were playing in the street. There were barricades top and bottom having a great time playing street games every day, out from early morning until late at night, um, and just thinking this was this was a great time ever. And it wasn't it wasn't scary. It was actually it was enjoyable. It was um, the feeling of just the whole street coming together because we lived street by street and we didn't we weren't allowed out of the street. And then I remember that there was a shortage of food 
and uh, the matriarch, if you like, of the street um, had called every door and got every person in every house to pull all the food that they had in order that they start like a um, like they start cooking for everyone in the street. I remember then lorries and vans coming. Um, it was said by the UDA and there were milk churns fresh from a farm where you went with your milk bottles to go around um, and you could get you could get your milk bottles filled. I remember it was the first time I'd had cereal in a week and I thought it was great because normally it was cereal every day, you know, it was the first time cereal in a week. And then there was other food parcels arrived and there was just that feeling of, I think you mentioned it there, Connell, that, you know, it was like a, it was like a civil war going on and that everybody had to pull together. There was a civic unity, if you like, um, where everybody had to pull together. But there was other things going on at that time. Um, and I reflected that in my play as well, that the, the level of domestic violence in the community where, where women were not supported um, and where people were hushing things up. The, the women who um, had got had pregnant and didn't, didn't want to continue with that pregnancy and where did they go and what did they do? So there was a lot of other underlying things at that period um, that, that halted women's movement, if you like, in detrimental ways that we've never ever explored. So I have sort of mixed feelings about the, about the strike. Thank you so much, Don. Really interesting, and particularly like sort of these views, which give us a little bit of a different angle on things and women's perspectives. Very important. Some of the, and I think sometimes the way that this happens often is that they kind of ghettoize it and they say, "Let's just hear about one part of this," and actually just try and provide a diverse range of perspectives. Thank you so much. Um, next up, we have Carmel Gates, who's general secretary of NIPSA Union, the largest trade union in Northern Ireland. Um, she's been a member of NIPSA for nearly 40 years, was elected on the union's main, general, uh, main leadership body, the General Council, for a quarter of a century, and has also served as president. She was particularly involved in the coordination of the recent public sector strike in January, uh, a strike that arguably had some influence of, on pressure on politicians who soon after decided to resume power sharing, so an interesting sort of flip side strike, if you like, to that. Carmel, you're most welcome. Um, what are your memories of May 1974 and what was going on? Um, well, I, I have very limited memories because although I was a wee bit older than Dawn, um, I still hadn't reached my teenage years. So, um, so I, I do recall it and I recall the feeling more than the events, if, if that's understandable. Um, I come from Cool Island, which is a mainly Catholic town. And I grew up in a in a big family. I'm the second youngest of, of nine children. So um, I mainly remember the discussions in the house at the time and the fear, um, if I'm honest, um, as, as to, um, the, you know, because I think, you know, people didn't know what was going to what was going to happen. There was a, a sense of of no control. Um, I do remember, you know, because our bread deliveries came from a, a, pr a Protestant bakery and, and the guy who delivered our bread was, was a Protestant worker. Um, our milk deliveries came from a um, Protestant creamery and the driver was a, a Protestant. Um, our coal was delivered by a Catholic, but the deliveries to him were were, were from Protestants. So very quickly we, we ran out of everything. Um, now, the you know, I, I, because it's a country town, we did, you know, I, I, as Dawn has just said, I remember the milk coming in churns direct from the farms um, unpasteurised and also a wee bit uh, hurry, if I remember. Um, and um, and then we, so we did get eggs and my mother was a great baker. So we'd, and and I think that there'd been time to, to do a bit of stockpiling. So I do remember that we'd, now how we managed, because at that stage, we lived hand to mouth. It was never, you know, you didn't have like today, you didn't have a freezer full of, of goods that you could rely on. Um, literally everything that came into the house was bought with that week's wages and was eaten and, and finished in the week. And, and then you, you know, um, I often had to go down at that stage to, to collect my dad's wages if, um, you know, so my mum we could get the dinner on the day that he could pay it, I would have gone down to pick them up and, and bring them back and, you know, in cash. I remember the day I lost them, but that's another story. Um, but so we lived hand to mouth. So it was, um, 
and I do remember it was, um, I, I suppose I mainly remember, because I didn't know what was going on, um, didn't understand what was going on, but I do remember the feeling of, of fear that existed in the house, particularly my mummy. She was, like, she spent that time um, kind of constantly worrying, praying, like nobody's business. She prayed all the time, but during that, I remember particularly, there was a lot of rosaries said. Um, so it was the discussion amongst my older brothers and sisters um, about, you know, and, and then at the beginning, um, my parents were adamant I was going to school. Um, even though there was that kind of fear because we, we travelled to school on a bus, um, but very quickly there weren't any buses because at that stage it was, um, if I remember, I think, I think I remember the first Catholic bus driver that we had coming on our school route and that was a significant event. So most of the bus drivers in our area um, were, um, were Protestants, so very quickly we didn't have buses, but I think it, Anyway, even at at the beginning, although there was the idea that we would all go to school and the determination that we would all go to school, I think very quickly it was realised that it might be safe. So we we stopped, but but we didn't get out of doing schoolwork, I remember, and I think I ended up doing more homework and, and stuff like that than I would have done if I'd been in school. I was think I was glad to get back to school um, because we weren't allowed to lift our heads out of our books, even if we weren't at school. Um, so um, I suppose... For me, um, and it is odd, and I'd be interested to hear the gentleman beside me um, talk about whether or not, because that was a time that was just after the, the minor strike in Britain that brought down the Heath government, um, and whether that, as as a workers' event, was was inspiration. Because obviously, here um, in this part of the world, there are great traditions of the trade union movement, um, and you know, at the height of it, the NALP had hundred thousand people were voting 100,000 votes for the NLP. So there was, in and around that time, I think, working class feeling and working class tradition and thoughts about the trade union movement as a working class, um, you know, organisation. Um, and that, I think, set it back to some degree because I think that any unity that it built, you know, became quickly, you know, well, uh, I think, I think maybe did undermine um, until the movement took, you know, took itself back into um, or asserted itself again through such things as the Better Life for All campaign in, in, in 1976. But I'd be interested to hear if um, there was any inspiration from the minor strike, if that's what, what led to it or sparked it or give uh, Protestant workers the, the idea that to use their, their strength in that capacity. But as I say, I mean, I'll finish, I'll probably talk too long, but um, for me, mainly the issue at the time and my feeling at the time was one of fear, insecurity, not known um, powerlessness, I think, uh, was was the key feeling in, in my family home. And I do remember that my dad was involved with others um, in, as, as vigilantes just sitting in the town um, in the worry that, you know, that there would be um, an intrusion into the area and, you know, were there to protect the, the families and, and the town. So, um, as I say, limited limited in relation to the strike, but more of feeling of, of the events rather than the events themselves. Thank you, Carmel. And actually, I think your, your memories are very vivid there. And I do think we'll come back to the industrial point and in terms of the political aspect of this. Certainly, I think most people on the history side of things would say that the fact that it was a Labour government at the time, a British Labour government, there's always been controversy about the British Army and the security forces tackling loyalist paramilitaries. And certainly there was always a view that a Labour government, as opposed to a Conservative government, would, would never send the army in to crush a strike. You know, in the broader British context, I really think that's incredibly important to mention. So thank you very much. We'll, we'll come back to that. Um, and actually, you like how you introduced that, not so many memories and actually lots of very vivid social history memories of this time. Harry Donaghy is our next speaker up, uh, who is one of the coordinators of the Fellowship of Maisines Association, uh, which has promoted cross-community dialogue and peace building since 2002. Uh, Harry's from a Workers' Party of Ireland uh, background and had been through the maelstrom of the Troubles uh, prior to the key cross-community work which is ongoing and which he's been involved with since then. I quoted Harry as one of the people earlier who said uh, that Sunningdale is perhaps the great lost opportunity in lots of ways. Um, Harry, big welcome. Um, can you tell us about 
May 1974 and what was going on in your world? I was uh, 16 at the time and just started my first job. Uh, um, I, left, uh, I left school, which was in Commie Chef in the Royal Avenue Hotel. I, um, I'd grown up, uh, if that's the correct description, uh, in a very political household. Uh, my father uh, was a good friend of your grandfather, uh, uh, Paddy. My father was councillor for the Falls Ward in the Northern Ireland Labour Party in the 1960s into uh, the early 70s. Now, I, I, at that particular time, I was also a member of uh, a political group and, and who had an armed wing. Um, and two years previous to uh, the strike uh, itself, uh, that organisation, uh, because of uh, the horrors that were happening, uh, especially in 1972, called a conditional ceasefire and asked or uh, said to the other uh, armed groupings across the, uh, the spectrum that uh, some kind of talks process says had to be entered into to help in some way, to try in some way <coughs> uh, to bring uh, the sectarian slaughter that was rampant uh, uh, at the time to some sort of uh, uh, agreed conclusion. Uh, again, this is the era before the internet, mobile phones and, 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 and stuff. So uh, association with uh, uh, previously and membership of Northern Ireland Labour Party and the trade union movement was a, a, a good conduit where people could, uh, it says, uh, if not talk directly, face to face with one another, but they, they, they had the opportunity to uh, communicate messages uh, regarding the overall uh, uh, political situation, uh, situation and where we had reached at that particular uh, juncture in, in, in time. And it did, now there was, I remember, uh, uh, as, as uh, uh, a teenager, uh, uh, that the, the, the idea of civil war was spoken about quite, quite, a, quite a great deal. And uh, again, it, it seemed that it was heading uh, 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 that way. The, the numbers involved and, and, and the, her, uh, the influence uh, of, of what was happening was spreading right through all of society. As you say, even leafy suburbia, uh, uh, says in the Malone Road, uh, says uh, uh, it was starting to impinge on them uh, uh, again. So, uh, again, I have to be you know, circumspect in the thing is that <clears throat> uh, certainly uh, the, the political organisation I was a member of in the thing said, uh, was wholeheartedly, it stood unequivocally uh, and said so at the time that uh, the year before, another of the armed groupings uh, uh, involved in the conflict had declared that 1973 would be the year of victory. Uh, uh, Liam McMillan, who was a, 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 a leading member of uh, uh, the political movement I was a member of, uh, declared, again, wasn't just speaking to members of the organisation, but to wider society in general, that republicanism stood not on the brink of victory, but on the brink of sectarian disaster. It, it, it could have uh, uh, went very, very badly, uh, although the situation wasn't good. But looking back, uh, it says, met uh, some of the people who would have been front and centre, especially from the loyalist side uh, in the compounds in, in Long Case, and realised then that within loyalism, uh, there was, it wasn't just the stock and trade portrayal of uh, your 
uh, basic uh, 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 loyalist, he said there were just political, serious political thinking going on at the time and being discussed in the, the organization uh, who were uh, substantial numbers of people uh, in prison at the time. And again, the, uh, as I said to you earlier, uh, Connell, it's hard to believe that it's 50 years uh, uh, from that uh, particular uh, event. But again, the, the, I do still believe that uh, when the talks started off in 73, between the parties and all the Sunningdale talks, I mean, people did see it uh, as uh, probably the, the best opportunity up until then for some form of uh, civilized conversations to actually take place among the uh, uh, unionists and non-unionists, uh, uh, he says in that regard, about uh, trying to make uh, uh, the place where we all lived and called home uh, a, better, a better place. Thank you very much, Harry. Um, and I think it's very interesting, actually, Harry and our next speaker, uh, Jackie uh, Redpath, were, were both at the conference, uh, survivors of the conference 10 years ago. Um, but, but Harry, I'm much, you remember that day as well, and some of the people who are no longer with us, including Austin Curry, who was on the same panel with you there on the bottom right. Um, I think it tells you again about some of the names and how interesting they were and how valuable their contributions were. Um, our next speaker was also there that day, Jackie Redpath, um, uh, who is Chief Executive of the Greater Shankill Partnership uh, and a man with a long history in the Shankill's development and politics, uh, born into an evangelical Christian background uh, in the Woodvale area. Um, after his education at Queen's, Jackie was based in the Hammer areas of, of the Shankill, working for the Shankill Community Council. He became involved in the Save the Shankill campaign, which is... Um, memorialized in a brilliant book by Ron, Ron Viner, um, and uh, in an effort to really save exactly that, the Shankill's way of life. Uh, in 1977, Jackie started working at the, Greatest, the Shankill Education Workshop, and in the late 80s, he joined the Greater Shankill Development Agency as a director. Uh, he remains a part of the fabric of the community there and has been doing vital work around challenging educational underachievement too. Jackie, Big welcome. Tell us about your memories of May 1974 and what stands out for you about it. Yeah, it's a bit like an age confessional here, you know, as we go along the table. <laughs> I don't know what you're going to say, Jackie, but yeah, my memories fade. Um, yeah, so so as you point out, Connell, I was, I was actually a community worker in the Shankill at that time, uh, as opposed to being in a paramilitary organisation. and. Uh, I suppose that's when community workers were just community workers. And um, the reason I wasn't in a paramilitary organization, because it was perfectly normal to be uh, a member in the Shankill um, at that time, uh, was you know due to an upbringing that I had, which was um, something of a Taliban evangelical upbringing uh, that separated me off from everything that went on around me. Um, I sort of moved away from that quite quickly when the troubles started and got into proper full swing and after 69 and um, the reaction of the church, Shankill Baptist Church, was to do away with their Sunday night gospel meeting when they were meant to be saving souls like and all the souls were out in the street rioting and all this sort of thing so they, they closed that meeting down on a Sunday night their gospel meeting so as they wouldn't get their cars damaged. And I had asked to be, you know, I was young, and uh, asked, could I have a church hall to bring the, the they were called peer education now, to bring the young people, peer work, youth work, you know, bring the young people in that were ratting instead of them ratting and maybe tell them about Jesus or whatever. Uh, but it was refused. The elders of the church said no because uh, they might smoke and damage the floor. Um, so we opened a wee house which became the Jesus Liberation Front on the Shankill and that sort of kept me out of the paramilitaries, you know, that upbringing and then I was part of a sort of Jesus army um, that was going to save the world and save the Shankill and all that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, what was happening then, uh, apart from the troubles in 
working class communities across Belfast and uh, in the Shankill was massive redevelopment going on. And I've called it the other troubles because I think I could pose an argument that it impacted more negatively on people's lives than even the troubles did and, and continues to resonate down, down these decades. And you couldn't avoid it because there was bulldozers at the end of your street that were knocking whole streets down in one go, displacing people there outside Belfast or up to Glencairn or wherever. Or to Craigavon, in fact, to give you £300 if you had moved to Craigavon. Those people moved about five times. Uh, and, you know, it was just crazy what was going on. They dismantled, the, plan the planners hollowed out the shankle and dismantled an entire way of life under the, 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 the business of dealing with the slums, which were slums, um, but, but they went about it entirely the wrong way. And it was at that point that I realised that, you know, things that were heavenly weren't really all that earthly use at that point of what was going on in the streets and got involved in community work. And I got a job with the Shankill Community Council three months before the UWC strike. Um, I was the first, the Community Council got a post, the first community organisation to get a post independently of government, because until then, what Quentin will remember is the Community Relations Commission existed and employed brilliant, very often brilliant, uh, field officers who did community uh, development work across Belfast and across Northern Ireland, in fact. Uh, but this was the first organisation to employ its own. I was given the rather grand title of secretary organiser that I think had some sort of trade background, union background, because you need to remember this, that both at the strike and people involved in community development, like Jackie Hewitt, you mentioned, for example, all had, had trade union backgrounds, been educated in trade unions. They were shop stewards. They knew about organising stuff. Uh, and, and so... I was thrown into this. The first day I got into work in February that year, uh, I was given a docket to take to a local butcher's because there was uh, one entire street in the Shankill and the Hammer, Richmond Street, living, had been flooded out, the entire street of the old houses, and were living in the back of Agnes Street, Methodist Church and a youth club there. They lived there for a month, in fact. They were well fed for that month, and it was great practice run for the UWC strike a few months later, but... Um, it was hard even getting some of them home at the end of it because it was a real communal event. People were lying on, on wee camp beds and, and getting cooking and getting meat brought in and vegetables and stuff uh, and doing that until they could get the, the houses repaired and, uh, of, a of, a, of a kind and back into their homes. So when I got... That, that was a full month, month and a half, and it was quite a baptism of fire in organising stuff. When the UWC strike happened... I stood in awe of the organising ability of those that were involved in it, uh, and primarily, I think, uh, in, in terms of the UDA. Um, it was quite a phenomenal feat uh, to work on so many fronts, both, you know, the political, uh, if you want to call it, on the streets, in terms of, call it military at a minute, and for the commas side of it, the security side of it, and in terms of, you know, within their own areas of, of feeding uh, and ensuring that there was food uh, coming through in the long haul over whatever length it lasted, three, four weeks, was amazing. And what also amazed me during it, watching it, was that, you know, you weren't needed because they were doing all the organising. I just was watching it and learning uh, because the other thing that was amazing about it was the sense of community that it engendered in loyalist working class areas. It was very intense. Now, I'm not ignoring here all the negative side of what was going on that, that, uh, in terms of the strike and stuff, and some of it's been referred to here. Not ignoring that at all. I'm just saying that's what I observed uh, in the Shankill at that time. And I believe, and I'll finish with this, that the UWC strike stands out as the end, the last death throes of something which was, you know, the, the first 50 years of Northern Ireland with a unionist uh, government, uh, which had been stood down two years previously in 1972. And this was the last kick of resistance to what was coming down the line, as expressed in Sunningdale and then later. But what it also led to, and I believe there's a thread, sometimes a very weak thread, but there's a thread 
from that strike that leads through to the Good Friday Agreement and indeed leads through to what we have right now. Um, you know, I think Geoffrey Donaldson learned lessons of what happened at uh, to David Trimble, uh, which he uh, had a part in. Um, but I think he has also learned lessons of what happened to Brian Faulkner back at the UWC strike. That's a political thread through, but also in paramilitary terms, I think there's a strong thread that led through to, you know, beyond the religious divide and the common sense documents that the UDA propo uh, pr pr produced at the time, or sorry, later. Um, what Harry talks about going on in long cash at the time in terms of thinking led uh, essentially by Gusty Spence at that point that, that uh, you know, took, took expression back on the street in the volunteer political party in the Shankill and elsewhere, but also then ultimately in Don's PUP. So I think there's a thread can be traced through to that. For me, and I'll finish with this, the important thing was as I watched it, I thought we are not going to win this fight against the planners without the muscle that the UWC strike showed. And it wasn't a week after it closed down that we didn't approach uh, one of the leaders, uh, well, the spokesman of the UWC strike, Jim Smith, uh, and all the leaders of paramilitary organisations in the Shankill to say, you've just had your fight. Here's the other fight that's happening on your streets about redevelopment. It's going to take from under you what you're trying to preserve in another way. You need to get involved in this. And the Save the Shankill campaign got formed in October 1974 with Jim Smith as the chair, uh, representatives of the three main paramilitary parties, the UVF, the UDA, and the Orange Volunteers at the time, all of, all of whom, if I remember rightly, were legal at the time. And other groupings like Women's Action, uh, which was, uh, you know, uh, if you want the women's UDA, but, <laughs> you know, were a group of women on the Shankill that were highly organised, and then community organisations, and interestingly, churches. Uh, but what marked it out was, I think, in terms of one of your points, is that, that a lot of the people involved in it had trade union background and experience as shop shirts, both in the UWC strike and in the Save the Shankill campaign that then I would claim became the most successful community action campaign in the United Kingdom, but I would, wouldn't I? Thank you very much, Jackie. Some some terrific uh, memories there. And I also liked how you're kind of looking ahead a bit for us as well in terms of thinking what it means today and what the, what the links are later on. Last but not least is uh, Jackie MacDonald, who was born and brought up in South Belfast around groups in his youth, including the Woodvale and Shankill Defence Associations. He was involved in some of the loyalist distribution activities I mentioned earlier. He is a spokesperson for the Ulster Political Research Group and was close with several key loyalist leaders of yesteryear, including John McMichael, David Adams and others. In the early 2000s, um, sometimes forgotten, Jackie met with, um, often with the Irish president at the time, Mary McAleese and her, hus her husband, and the Taoiseach, uh, Bodhi Ahern. Jackie, big welcome. Um, can you tell us some of your memories of uh, May 1974? Uh, well, I'm speaking, I'm 100% from a paramilitary sense because I was, from day one of that strike, I was a volunteer in the UDA and the Murray, and we were, all we were interested in and all we were involved in was what was happening in the Murray. You know, some people would get the, the impression that this was a, a massive thing that was every every area was the same. You hear Don saying about the intimidation and threats. When we were in Dumoree, we didn't have to do that. We didn't threaten anybody. People came to us and asked to be intimidated because their boss wouldn't let them out of work. But uh, to go back to the very beginning of it, the uh, there was a series of one-day strikes before the big strike, and I was a dispatch manager in Balmore Furniture. And there's times I'd have been working maybe on a Thursday night getting paid overtime and the boss buying me a free supper to get a lorry loaded to go to London Dairy at, at 7 o'clock the next morning. And 7 o'clock the next morning, I'm doing my camouflage jacket on my wee hat, saying that lorry can't go anywhere. And he said, you, you got paid overtime last night? He says, that's only happening in the early hours. But that went on and on. And when the, uh, we would see them, remember again, as Harry says about no mobile phones or no, no, don't send an email to get something done here. 
it was somebody on a bike or somebody on foot or somebody maybe lucky enough to have a car because there wasn't too many of us had cars even then. Had to go to Sandy Road to find out what was happening. Uh, we got word through the local brigadier that uh, the strike was to start the 15th. The night before, as I said, I was a dispatch manager. I had the keys to the car parked in the factory and the keys to the lorry. So I took two other drivers around with me. We stole three lorries and we blocked off the three roads into our side of the Murray. The other side would be sort of seen as West Belfast, although it was all mainly Protestant at the time. So we blocked off those three. There was people there to either let the tires down or to slice the tires, whatever. So everywhere, the whole place was blocked. And uh, the next morning, about half six, I was standing at the Zebra Cross in Demurray. The first bus that came down, we stopped at Niger on the bus and says, just drive straight through to Belfast and tell them, don't be sending any more buses out but in case something happens. So the strikes officially started. And uh, again, it, it didn't kick off. In the first day or two, it was a wee bit slow. And people, some people were crying intimidation, but other ones were make, make, getting out of the factory, let on to go and buy a bun or to do, get something for their lunch, and were coming around and saying, could you phone our boss and get us out of here? We uh, we spoke to a fellow who ran the Orange Hall to Murray at the time, and he was uh, a bit reluctant at the start to let us take it over the Orange Hall, practically. As a matter of fact, some of the Orange men, when they found out that we had taken over, they left the lodge. I don't know where they went to, adult, a, different, a different lodge or wherever they went, but that was our headquarters for the duration of the strike. And all of us lived within half a mile of the Orange Hall, but we, we slept there, we stayed there with sleeping bags. We were on patrols every night. Uh, it took it in turns who was going to get home and get washed and change and what have you. Uh, but that, that's where we were billeted, if you like, for, for the duration. Uh, as it is, when the, the milkman, the, the, there was a factory, a dairy was up the road, uh, top of the Murray Lane. And we knew the fella who was driving the milk float at, at that time. Um, as he was driving past the range, he always says, Jordan, how much are the charges for the whole, the whole load of milk? £60. So we took the whole load of milk for £60. And then he went up and told his boss as he was hijacked. And he brought down another load. And he got another £60. Uh, Stuart had a supermarket about the Rose Garden beside the Iraqi Cricket Club. And it was closed because of the strike. But they had still a lot of stuff had been delivered. Went up and bought a, a, a lorry load of bread for, I think it was 5p a loaf. And brought it down to the Orange Hall and gave it out. Uh, we had let everybody know that it needed anything to come to the Orange Hall. We had people with jotters and pencils. The, the, any, ch uh, any children under two, a two year old, anybody on medication, anybody in essential services who had to get out, we made sure all that happened. There was one particular woman who had to take her child to hospital and she had no petrol in her car. And I had an old banger sitting outside my house. I hammered a nail through the, the petrol tank and let it run into a basin and give her the petrol to get to the hospital. And that's, but didn't, I didn't see the hardship and, and, and some of the really brutal stuff that happened in Belfast, but there was a lot of anger about them. It wasn't just about Sunningdale and Dublin. It was about the IRA and the atrocities. And like 1972 was when they introduced the car bomb. And that's why I joined the UDA on Bloody Friday. All, all that, the hatred was there, the anger was there, and then the threat of losing our country, uh, both by, should be by political means or by violence. It just wasn't happening. I always remember the woman in the East Dawn saying, when things are really tight, things are hard, she says, we'll eat grass. And that summed it up for a whole lot of people. That's where it got to. People were so determined. It was, everybody was together. Everybody felt the same way. Uh, some people were more inconvenienced by it than others. But whenever you hear a woman saying, and she wasn't a kid, she said, we'll eat grass. That was, the women came together, the unions came together, the politicians came together, the, the paramilitaries, everybody came together. And see, at the end of it all, some of us said, We'll give it up too soon. 
they should have held on and d did a bit more negotiating. But we weren't into that. We were paramilitaries. We had, we had joined the, the UDA to defend Ulster. And because of the IRA got so proactive, parts of our organisation got more proactive. But basically, we were there to walk the streets of the Murray. We used to do it every night, even before the strike, long after the strike. We, we went around every street in the Murray, and people were bringing us out cups of tea or juice or biscuits or whatever, and glad to see us. So the, the, the strike it was, we were in a different world from people in the Shangle, maybe or people in the East, or people further up the country. Colin Holliday is here with me. Colin, he would have other stories about the likes of Dremor and that way, but it's all different. It all, there's different reactions to these things and different ways of how people dealt with the situation. But we had a great relationship with the people in Dremor during that whole time. Thank you very much, Jackie. Um, I think it's very important, actually, Morris Hayes said the same thing at the conference 10 years ago, that people forget sometimes that the, the provisional IRA, the provost, as he called them, kept on going, and that that is in the context of what's going on, and that these things are never um, isolated uh, from each other. One of the other people that day, Glenny Barr, said that it was very controlled now. So, I mean, just to kind of broaden things out and ask a few individual questions of our panelists before I throw this open to the floor and have some questions and, and input from, from you all. Um, was there a point, we'll start with everyone here, but I mean, and we'll, we'll get, get to everyone at some point and on, on certain other things, but Jackie Glennie said that um, there was a strong sense that it was controlled through the UDA and the UWC at the start. Was there some, was there some kind of turning point when the wider Protestant community did seem to get behind you. There were certain things that sustained that strike in a weird way. There's this blazing hot weather people forget for two weeks the summer. This is what enables people to have the barbecues outside and so on that people are, remember. But Glenn Barr at that conference, and I remember you were there and the, attending that one, you remember his contempt is the only way I can put it for unionist politicians, people like Harry West, obviously Faulkner, obviously people like Basil McIver in the executive, this sense of this is the, the Protestant elites, the unionist elites that regard us as dirt and regard us as not equal to them. I think that was what his kind of class conscious take on it. Was there a turning point, Jackie, in which actually you felt, okay, we have actually got everybody from our community or the wider unionist family on board in this? I think people were adapting to the whole overall situation, but certainly whenever Harold Wilson came out and called us all spongers, you know, people started wearing the sponge in their lapels. That that re that really brought everybody together. But uh, like, this is all new to us, all new to our people. You know, we had maybe three or four years of the IRA murders and bombings going on, and you, you never get used to that. But we were adopting our lifestyle was built around that, you know, and then all of a sudden they're talking a storm about Sunningdale. I'm saying this is an extra threat. Are they using this because of that? People were really, really concerned about it. And it was, in 1974, people would have seen Northern Ireland as a unionist state. And they would have said, see, if you don't like it, we over the border. And the argument that was the people, the Protestants, the other side of the border, so if you don't like it, you go over that side. There was, a, like I say, about the anger and the hatred and the fear, you know, because ordinary working class people weren't into the politics, they weren't into all that stuff, but they were into it whenever their family members were getting killed or they couldn't win the town to do a bit of shopping. So it all came together, and with, with, with the advice that were given by the leaders of the strike, if you like, the Andy Terry's or, or the Glenny Bars or the politicians themselves, like Paisley, Paisley was stuck in the St. Lawrence or something, I think, whenever the, the strike started. And he never got back in time for what was happening. And when they were having a big meeting of a storm one day, uh, all, the, all the top men were sitting around the table and Paisley walked in and he sat in Glenny Barr's chair. Glenny was out of the room, whatever. And when Glenny came back into the room, he says to him, that's my seat, move. And Paisley made the excuse something like, and this one's got arms on it, it's comfortable. Two fellas walked in and lifted him in the chair and all moved him around the side and gave Glenny Barr an order chair at the top of the table. But th that's, 
you, you see the you see the, those photographs of the people who were in the room talking about Sunningdale. If you saw all the photographs of the people who were in the room talking about what to do about Sunningdale, you know, it, it was a whole different story. Thank you. And it's a great story, is that so, sometimes people do do this. They say, why, why haven't you mentioned Paisley in the UWC strike? He, he's in Canada for the first week, you know, and he kind of runs back when he realises it's a big success in a very Paisley-eyed way, realises that he needs to get in on the act. I thought he was coming over to take over, just so he was going to run the show. And he was, he was literally put in his place. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, Carmel, I just wanted to go back to something you were mentioning there about the sort of broader... Um, industrial um, backdrop as well in the miners' strike. I think it's very important to remember that, and anyone living in the UK at the time would have remembered the the lights going as well at the time, and and perhaps also a more a different era for all of us in terms of the power of the trade union movement, people being members of trade unions. This obviously affects us in the present day with workers' rights under threat, zero use of zero hour contracts, and so on and so forth. Um, did you? Do you, when you think back on, I want to people, have people think a little bit about the legacy of the strike now and what it means now, um, and what it kind of, where we are with it 50 years on, um, in industrial and trade union terms, is the strike something which you can, you, you, you're uncomfortable about seeing as a trade union action? Or is it something which you can fully identify, yes, this is a part of the labor movement from a particular section of the community? Um, well, <clears throat> I grew up calling it a stoppage rather than a strike. Um, and, and for us, it was um, a different, um, and for me as a trade unionist, because it was from one side, um, and because there was persuasion for people not to go to work. Um, for me, a strike is something that workers do voluntarily. It's coming together. It's a, a, a movement of strength with single purpose. Um, and I mean, I see it, I mean, maybe not everybody does, but I see it as a class action and an action by, by workers coming together and in unity. Um, that strike or that stoppage was very much, um, you know, caused disunity. Um, but in the tradition of, of, of this place, because I mean, as I said, quickly afterwards, the, you know, in 76, we had the Better Life for All campaign from the Trades Council. And then, I mean, this is also the anniversary of the, of the miners' strike of '84, which um, was a, a coming together of unity. And and I think, you know, it'd be interesting to hear what other people's memories are of that. But I remember collecting money for the miners, and I remember going round doors collecting money, and the people with no money emptying their purses in and saying, "Don't let them starve them back to work," and collecting money and and this part of the world gave more money per head to the miners' strike than any other area, even within areas that were closer to mine and regions. So that tradition um, has existed. I think one of the things that that strike sort of taught me or, or, or told me was um, the importance of workers coming together and workers' unity. Um, NIPSA now has in its constitution, um, myself and, 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 and other of my comrades, put into the constitution that we are a cross-community organisation. Um, and workers' unity is something that I have been absolutely passionate about ever since I became involved in a, as a trade unionist. I call myself for workers' unity and socialism as my kind of strap line on my Twitter account and, my, and everything else, because I think that, you know, one of the ironies, and, and just listening to what Jackie was saying about how little Protestant workers had, um, the, I mean, you know, workers on the Shankle were, lived in the same poverty as workers on the Falls um, at this time. And, you know, so there was, a, it was a common misery um, at the time. And, you know, so I think that, um, Remembering that and remembering, you know, how, um, you know, workers came together in the shipyard at a time when there was intimidation of Catholic workers, right? So I think those traditions and that division, I think, has made many of us in the trade union movement now more adamant to maintain that unity, to not allow things to divide us that can otherwise do because the constitutional position comes up every now and again at various issues. There have been issues and, and movements and, and events that have caused trouble seeped into the trade union movement. I've always tried 
to address everything from a class point of view rather than a religious point of view um, and have been through my whole life um, kind of determined that uh, what, that I would do whatever I could to make sure there was there was class unity and I think that we've always had a stronger class tradition here to some degree um, and I think it's that that tradition can come back and flourish and I think it did on January the 18th this year when we all came together in a public sector strike um, that was um, you know as strong against the government and for the wrongdoing of austerity and you know poverty wages and 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 destroying our services and I think that that's a legacy that I would like to see that we take from it and no going back you know as our as our motto into the future. Thank you, Carmel. It's very, very interesting. I appreciate that. Um, Dawn, just wanted to pick up on something that um, Jackie Redpath had noted there in terms of the continuum of the politics, and you're someone who was around later political developments in the Progressive Unionist Party and some of the other men names that were mentioned with Gusty Spence and, and David Irvin as well. In 1985, in the op Unionist opposition to the Anglo-Irish Agreement, Peter Robinson is still talking about the UWC strike. I, we will introduce another stoppage if this comes along. Um, Paisley always mentions it, despite, as has been noted, not being hugely involved. Um, was the UWC strike dawn and, and the anti-Sunningdale protest, was that ever in the minds of some of the dialogue and negotiations that you were around in the 1990s, the mid-1990s, leading up to the Good Friday Agreement? Or was it very clear that that was a different political era? No, I think there was there was a lot. I mean, Harry and Jack, Jackie um, talked about the political discussions going on that, that came out, you know, from um, the Ulster Workers' Council strike. So you had the common sense document coming from the UDA, the sharing responsibility document coming from the PUP. One of the first things I read when I joined the PUP was that thinking, which which actually was more. It was it was a developed political thinking that was evolving since the Ulster Workers' Council strike but actually came out in response to the Anglo-Irish Agreement. And it was the thinking that we need to share this place. Um, and the PUP thinking was we need to share responsibility for this place rather than, than share power because it was going to be um, a, a sectarian carve up. So we needed to involve everyone in that and we would share responsibility for governing this place. And that formed the basis of the PUP manifesto and the PUP thinking going into the negotiations around the Good Friday Agreement. And that thread, if you like, that Jackie talked about was always there for unionism. And and some of them, I, I know someone phrased around Sunning Deal for slow learners, can't remember who it was, but that thread has always been there. And the slow learners have been unionism failing to pick up the ball that we need to share this place with nationalism. And not only do we need to share this place with nationalism and share the governance, we actually have to afford nationalism um, legitimacy in terms of their what they want, and that's a united Ireland. So there has to be a north-south element to the governing of Northern Ireland, and there has to be a legitimate means by which nationalism strive for united Ireland, and that's through the principle of consent. Um, and I think our our hiccups and our kangaroo petrol devolution um, all along has been the failure of some within unionism to say this is the reality of the situation. This is where we're going to be and this is where we have to be. Otherwise, every time you go back to the table, there's going to be less and less on it. And I think, as, as Jackie said, Geoffrey Donaldson realised um, what happened to David Trimble. David Trimble um, was very brave in what he did. Um, I know he regretted um, to the day he died that he had to walk back into the talks um, with the UDP and the PUP. He had preferred to have the strength himself. But that shows you how progressive those parties were in actually turning to David Trimble and the Ulster Union's party saying, you've got to get in here. You've got to get reach this agreement. This is the best opportunity we've ever had. And it was those within his own party, like Geoffrey Donaldson, Arlene Foster and others that, that actually turned against him. But they're now back. Geoffrey's now back at the table. Um, and so there, there becomes this slow realisation within unionism that the only other, there is no other way to, for, for Northern Ireland to be governed except by, by all of the, the political uh, parties that exist within it.
very much, Don, and, and also, you know, we get the sense that after in 1998 as well, the because of the Westminster election I, I mentioned, it becomes a vote about Sunningdale, and the British and Irish governments both realise we put this to referenda, democratic votes in both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland uh, in 1998 as well. There were lots of learners around the place, and I think it's a really useful point to mention. I, I think I'm going to throw things open to the floor now and have some questions and also some uh, comments, uh, whatever people like. Before I do, just one final thing I wanted, because just on this contemporary political point, and I will get to Harry and Jackie Redpath again, but Jackie, you were one of the people who has recently been reported were uh, was one of the loyalist leaders who was supportive. Uh, I think actually was reported was the only loyalist leader of certain groups who was supportive of Jeff Jeffrey Donaldson um, going back in to uh, Stormont and in uh, power sharing. Um, is is there still for you? You know, you you've obviously moved then from quite a different scenario in 1974, being involved in uh, anti power sharing, anti Sunningdale initiative, to the present day. Do you observe that change in unionism that Dawn mentioned there as well, or um, are you just seeing these as totally different historical political events later well, on? The, 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 what brought about the change in me was John McMiggle. I started working with John about 75, and uh, we we're, were involved in all sorts of things together, but John was a thinker. He was always thinking ahead. He, he said to me one day, you know, we're killing each other, but it can't go on. You know, we're going to have to sit down and talk to people, and this was beyond the religious divide and common sense coming out of that. But just after, in 75, when they started working together, the brigadier in South Belfast was a fellow called Samuel Murphy from the Ormer Road. And I remember uh, in 1977, John and I were in his house talking to Sammy, and obviously he had been talking to other people who had been involved. Sammy was involved in the 74 strike, and we are talking about another strike in 77, and I said, it'll not work. Why not? I says, we took everybody by surprise, including ourselves. You know, the, the British have three years to figure out how to make sure this doesn't happen again. So they says, it worked the last time, it worked this time. And of course, it was a flap. It made us all look stupid. But I think John learned from that how important politics was. And he wanted involved in... There was, there was ordinary Catholics being killed. There was ordinary Protestants being killed. Children were being killed. It wasn't good for our country. And John tried to move on. He actually stood for election. And it, he was... I was with him campaigning around a lot of the streets of South Belfast. And if everybody that said they were going to vote for him voted for him. He, he, he would have been elected no problem. He got something like... I think it was 461 votes or 641 votes, something like that, and he was devastated. But he was still determined, and he would have, he would have spoken to politicians, and he, he was definitely trying to get away from the violence or, or just kill a take, excuse my language, or that sort of stuff. He was, he was, we have to move on here. This cannot go on. And he was talking to some of the Workers' Party at the time, he was talking to all sorts of people to try to get to move on. It didn't suit everybody. But we needed to get, and again, through John McMichael, I've watched things happening. Politicians won't speak to me if there's a camera about. You know, they'll speak to me in an orange hall or they'll speak to me somewhere. And if I was them, would I speak to me? I don't know. But w w people like myself, Colin Holiday, people close to me, I think we, we're entitled. I think we should be involved in some of the, the conversations that's happening around moving on because we have moved on to Mary McAleese, Bertie Ahern, even Hall Martin, the people we talk to. We talk to Sinn Féin. We've talked to Harry for a long time and some of his colleagues. We're a mirror of each other in many ways. It's time to move on. We cannot go back to that sort of stuff. And there's people, young, some young people think, uh, we have missed out here. We'll not be told what to do by grey hair down me. And you had your go at it, now it's our turn. Where's all that going to go? Somebody has to say, it's, it, it, Republicans aren't are a threat. They're not, it's not a violent threat. Yes, and there, are, there are political rivals. And we have, that's the way we have to look at it. And we all have to work together again. 
If, if we're only able to work together the way, uh, the way we worked in 74, we'll be all right. Thank you very much indeed for that. Um, so um, I think we have a microphone about the place. If anyone wants to um, make a point, ask a question. Uh, Paul Taggart, and to put it in context, I'm a teacher. I'm actually teaching this to the TCSE pupils at the moment. Some of the things I'm going to ask it actually is from what the students had asked this week. And someone said that could the executive, do you think, from, from the, let's say the working class lawyers' perspective, could the executive have done more, especially with the SDLP, you know, a party looking out for workers' rights, could they have potentially pushed it more to say to the workers um, in the UWC strike? You know, it's actually beneficial to have a government in Northern Ireland. You know, that's going to look after workers' rights. Probably sometimes you know, the previous um, OUP government was somewhat seen as almost the latest from, a, from that perspective. The other thing would be, um, I think there was a, an opinion poll, if my memory serves me correctly, that before the Council of Ireland was voted upon, that you know, there was a significant amount of support for a power sharing executive, irrespective of that February election. So it's almost a hypothetical question that, you know, could something have happened where if there maybe wasn't a person, I don't know you'd say that it was part of the equation, there had to be you know, a role for the Republic, but maybe that was delayed. Do you think at all, if that government could have had maybe six months a year, could it, you know, the benefits of what that government could do with the people of Northern Ireland might actually have potentially worked? Would, would, would Jackie or, or Harry, would you have any response to that in terms of the, I think it's kind of an interesting point with the, the SD, you know, the, the power sharing executive, when we think about power sharing and, and the, the government that we you have in Northern Ireland, you know, does what's its practical effect on what it does and what it achieves. Did you kind of get any notable sort of influence in your life? Did you feel that around the time or since? Yeah. Um, I mean, things were moving so fast. I think the Council of Ireland was a very significant thing in people's heads. I don't think there's any any doubt about that. And and I think there was some loose talk, maybe reported at the time, around that I can't remember I couldn't quote it back to you but it, it has been documented and it did uh, create a fear so, it, so it, it's too hard to say too difficult to say whether it would have made a big difference or not if it had just been power sharing I don't think the power sharing has ever been the big big difficulty uh, here uh, you know in, in recent decades uh, it would have been a new notion then obviously um, it existed for five months the executive and I talked about the maelstrom that the Shankill was going through before the strike with redevelopment and then for decades after it. We went up to meet Austin Curry, who was the Minister of Development, uh, about what was happening. And this is against the background of a video or a video newsreel that I saw recently of Brian Faulkner, who was Minister of Development before, you know, when the Unis government were, was in existence before 72 who visited the Shankill uh, and who was interviewed. The cameras were there and there was a woman remonstrating with him about the conditions she, were living in, she was living in, which today is beyond belief. I find it hard to uh, even recognise the craziness of, and the awfulness that people were living in at the time due to redevelopment. And she was remonstrating with him and he literally told her to stop and turned his back and walked away. Now that contrasts with Austin Curry in the power sharing executive as Minister of Housing who decided to do something about what was happening and I'll not go into the detail but it doesn't matter but I can remember the night before I went up with a delegation from the, the Shankill to meet him hearing people outside my door in the Shankill trying to find out who it was was going up they didn't know it was me I was glad to say but you know trying to find out who is this who's gone up who's these people that's gone up uh, so there were these things of, of you know, that, that were difficult at the time. I don't think anybody would have heard the SDLP within working class loyalist communities, whatever they were saying at that time. The biggest thing the SDLP did was what Conal talked about as Grander doing, which was the, the you know, uh, there were certain points during the strike that were critical points. Um, because as, as Jackie said, the first couple of days, you know, had a slow start to it. Uh, and, and people getting their benefits was a massive, a massive thing. And the sponsors' speech by Wilson just brought everyone uh, behind it because these were people that had laid down their lives and their families had laid down their lives for the United Kingdom, you know. And, and here they were being told, "Who are you? You know, your sponsors." So this, this, that, those were were big turning points. I just want to say one final thing, and don't want to lose this. 
for me, apart from learning about organising stuff from it that had relevance for community development, not just in the Shankill but elsewhere, uh, there was that thread coming through. But you see the political thread that we've referred to. It was built around. It, it was. We're talking about failed things that came out of about trade unionism, not learning lessons, etc. Working class loyalists didn't learn the lessons we. I was going to say we tried to. We did try to. And, you know, Glenn Barr became an expression of those. Glenn Barr was like, for me, the first David Irvine. And here's why he was important. He was able, I was going to use bad language there, he was articulate. And one of the things that was always said as a kid growing up was with nobody to speak for us because it was Stratton Mills, you know, the MP for North Belfast or whatever. And, and there was nobody there that could talk in the language that working class loyalists could talk. And there was Glenn Barr did it, and it became, ultimately became David Irvine. And I, that, there's a stronger thread than the personality one, but the personalities are important as well. Thank you very much, Jackie. Uh, any other points from the floor here? Uh, yeah, my, name, my name's Frank. Um, I find the discussion here extremely interesting. I was 20 during the Ulster Workers' Council strike um, from West Belfast originally. <clears throat> now, I left in August of 74 to go to London, spent four years there, and became immediately conscious of being Irish all the time I was there. People in London saw no difference in being anyone else, either from the Shankill, any other part of Northern Ireland or from down south. Um, <clears throat> and I'm just wondering, with the, the Unionist Loyalist position, I mean, how conscious are you all of the fact that, I mean, in Britain we're all seen as Irish, um, and does that have any impact? Um, and Jackie uh, MacDonald, Jackie, you refer referenced about the anger and the hatred in uh, Don Murray at the time, um, and about the IRA killings, but from a nationalist uh, perspective, the view was that the UDA had been killing innocent Catholics for years beforehand. Um, not IRA individuals, just innocent Catholics. And the joke was, in the West at, at that time, one of the jokes in, in West Belfast was, it was almost safer to be a member of the Provost than it was to be an ordinary Catholic trying to go about your normal business. Um, so I find that interesting, but and this sort of paranoia, it seemed in the time any reference to a Council of Ireland, any reference to a rule for the South, spread panic. It seemed to be strange if you were from a nationalist background, living in a nationalist area. But I'd like to finish with a question to you all, and particularly to the Unionist representatives. Where do you think that working class Protestants have not got behind, like for example, Don, the PUP, to the same extent that working class, working class Catholic strokes nationalists have with Sinn Féin? Do you want to? Um, it's an interesting question, and I remember David Irvine saying many, many years ago that if every UVF man voted for the PUP, we would have 12 Westminster MPs. Um, and they were, they were, the reality was that, that most of, of the UVF and working class Protestants uh, voted for the DUP, even though the policies of the DUP would be very conservative and, in my mind, anti-working class. And it's because the the divisive nature, it's because of the sectarian nature of our politics. And people want to vote for the party who's going to beat it up the other side the hardest. And it was always seen that the DUP were, were hardest on Sinn Féin. I remember their smash Sinn Féin campaign in the 1980s. And David Irvine saying, I wish they'd had a smash PUP campaign because we'd be the biggest party within unionism now. You know, so they, they just they don't they don't vote for policies. I've never known um, Protestant working class to vote for policies. And Protestant working class actually, in terms of turnout at elections, are are often lower than what they are in in middle class areas. And I remember the the DUP um, commenting. Um, McConnell said at the year I brought out the report on on educational disadvantage. Um, they said that I had done more damage single-handedly to the, to the DUP than the Ulster Unionists put together. And somebody said, well, why, why don't you look at the, elect or the education system and try to benefit 
you know, young working class people in working class areas. And they said, because working class Protestants don't vote, our vote comes from the middle class. Thank you very much, Dawn. Um, just going to take a final final point down here in a second. But Harry, just before we do, you know, your your the organisation you were involved with, the Workers' Party, had a lot of political success in, in the south of Ireland, and uh, with Pranjus de Rasa and uh, Thomas Megilla and others. Um, can you shed any light on that, Harry? Just because of all the work that Mazines does, bringing together loyalists, and there's been some tremendous events that I've been at, which you've done over the years. You know, um, it's this thing that Jackie mentioned earlier of the, the you know, we, we had all the power and we kind of hand it back straight away. Why, why do you think, as someone who's got that quite unique overview of these things in community terms and comparatively, perhaps, why that happens for, for maybe the uh, Sinn Féin, the Workers' Party, at a certain time, Sinn Féin later at another time, and doesn't happen for loyalist political groups learning from 1974? Again, I think it was touched on near the start. Uh, I think, uh, you mentioned it as well. And uh, maybe we don't individually and collectively recognize the role of fear in the politics uh, of this place, especially within uh, non-nationalist, uh, whatever political uh, makeup that, that entails. I mean, uh, was... Sunningdale to most unionists, uh, 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 especially loyalists, the fourth home rule bill crisis, you know, the, the, the thing. and uh, again, uh, hopefully the, the ability to reflect on uh, our contemporary history can, can help maybe in some way because uh, my grandfather put on a British Army uniform and 1914, uh, along with tens of thousands of other nationalists, this is pre-partition. I think it says because they they believe they says that the concept of home rule, he says for Ireland was a good thing. Uh, now looking back uh, on the time uh, over a hundred years ago, what they were actually after the home rule move, uh, movement wanted pretty innocuous compared to what uh, 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 came later. But after all of that, it's a, the, the, the turmoil of uh, a world war, uh, the, the, the horrendous uh, uh, loss of life. I think so. When my grandfather uh, uh, returned home, uh, demobbed, and after he, got, he was wounded and fighting the Turks in, in Palestine, uh, and was demobbed out of the uh, the army. He says uh, 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 on his way home from a Red Cross hospital in Cairo. Uh, uh, what did they come back to? I think he says uh, uh, an uh, an inability uh, within unionism, especially as represented by Ian Paisley in the modern context. Paisley was at the the back. Or they're leading the charge against everything. He got rid of uh, uh, Terence O'Neill, uh, Chichester Clark, uh, and, and Faulkner to uh, Brand Faulkner to uh, uh, a certain degree. But one of the ironies in, in all of that, in one of the last interviews uh, he ever gave, Paisley said the thing. He says, "Well, maybe we should have." Uh, he says, uh, "Treated the people who were behind." the civil rights movement with a wee bit more understanding and compassion because what they were actually asking for, he says, I mean, how, how could you argue, argue with it in the modern context? So uh, again, fear is, 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 is uh, we, we can't underestimate it in, in the thing. He says, well, it's, it's Jackie and uh, two Jackies, the thing I'd refer to as well. Uh, once that thing was mentioned about the Council of Ireland about the involvement of Dublin government. That's, that was the tripwire that, uh, that sent that shockwave right throughout uh, 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 unionism. And I think it's only basically in the decades after that 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 uh, uh, ability, he says, to, to even tolerate 
they think he says that there always was an Irish dimension. Uh, the saint says, "Now nah, it, it's it's whatever in the future that uh, uh, dimension takes is going to be." He says the the thing, but it can't it can't ever be. He says that armed nationalism has to understand that uh, uh, it doesn't matter how much you've got in your arsenal and the thing, uh, uh, thing or you're long, you keep things going, you will never convince a sizable uh, percentage of the population of uh, 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 people who live on this island to go or that they to take them somewhere where they don't want to go. Thank you very much, Harry. And I think it's a really worthwhile point in terms of some of the people who whose political careers don't survive, including Brian Faulkner on the right here, um, you know, stepping back again, seeing someone who was of immense ability. My granddad had a particular admiration and fondness, tried to protect some of the unionist ministers from selling too much when other SDLP colleagues were trying to um, get too much uh, concessions. And he had an awareness, along with Conor Cruz O'Brien, about how to sweeten that a bit more. And Faulkner's loss, I think, for, to not have to miss out on him as a prime minister and a leader is Northern Ireland's loss, I have to say, stepping out, you know, from, from a different political stable from, from Faulkner. Um, we'll have one more point at the bottom, at the, at the stage, at the foot of the stage here. I think, uh, actually, Harry added a lot of information to what it was going to raise. And uh, just finally, the, re the reason it seems significant to me, and also Jackie Redpath mentioned it was the end of something. Um, and that's really not just, I mean, in a sense, yes, for unionists, but also for people like myself who'd come through a Northern Ireland Labour Party background and had grown up in West Belfast with Shankill and Falls Labour Parties both being in good uh, conversations with each other. And I did know, uh, I did know um, Harry Donaghy, the councillor for the Labour Party in West Belfast. So I, I'm... I, there were, it seemed to me that I was also very glad of the figure that um, I think it's Gail gave us of a hundred thousand um, uh, uh, Carmel, sorry, Carmel, Carmel gave us of a hundred thousand people in the, the Northern Ireland Labour Party. Um, it might seem like a very because they no longer exist. And recently, Brian Garrett was buried, who is someone who was very significant in talking during the Ulster Workers' Strike as a go-between between, between the um, loyalist um, uh, command, high command at Horse Undone Road and um, other the everybody else. And in a sense, the great loss, and I mean, the society has changed, obviously, and we won't be back there again. And we even now, uh, and the question someone asked recently why the SDLP hadn't uh, thought about representing workers' rights, why that's a less, as, you know, that's a sort of, um, a less um, important aspect of the SDLP's work. One of the things, though, that struck me, because I think I am one of the kind of people who left Northern Ireland because of what happened at, at, in 1974. I, I came back in 2007, but I did think, even as a Catholic teacher in a Protestant school, and even as an early per, um, young socialist in the Labour Party, and even with the, extra, the with that kind of positive political background in a period where there's a split trade union movement, Irish Labour, Irish trade unions and, in, 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 and UK trade unions, I still think it's, was, it was such a signif significant loss and I wasn't the only one to leave during that time. So in a sense, the society we've come back to, is it a step back um, in terms of labour relations? We have less... Uh, the whole globally societies have changed and I, I just think um, are we, was it part of a bigger global change? Sorry, that, that, that's a very long way to the question. Apologies for that. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think, is there one more, one more point? Um, if we can get the microphone to the gentleman and then we'll, I think our time is, is sort of limited after that. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks very much. Really interesting uh, discussion. I just wondering about not so much the past, but the present and the future. How would something like the Ulster Workers Council strike play out now against the next political crisis that comes along? 
or against you know the backdrop of worsening wages, worsening living standards, you know, zero hours contracts, precarious labour. How how do you think that would play out when something other uh, situation arises? Thank you very much, and I'm going to let each of the panelists say if it can be reasonably brief, just a few a few responses to that. Jack, starting with you, Jack. You know, it, it wouldn't play out now in the same way. I mean, as Jackie already indicated, by 1977, a second go at it didn't work. Uh, and we don't have the industrial base, the heavy industrial base. We can't turn the lights off anymore, you know, in that way, essentially. I may be corrected about that or not, but I don't think that's the case. What amazes me is, is, is what's in your question, because you're absolutely right. I mean, Margaret Thatcher got brought down by one thing, by the, the council tax or whatever it was called. Was it council tax? Was it? Poll. Yeah, yeah, poll tax, yeah. Got brought down by the poll tax. Um, <laughs> like, we've cut that multiplied so many times over. I mean, in, in France, a lot of years ago, when the petrol prices went up, the lorry drivers brought the country to a standstill. Or before this whole thing kicked in with the cost of living and all that's come off it, I mean, the petrol prices went up. Do you even think? about that now it, it's beyond comprehension to me as to why as a society and this requires analysis that we have settled for the situation that has been imposed on us over the last 14 years by the the, the tory government um i don't understand it obviously there's been a loss of the industrial power that existed back at, in the day but don't forget that was you know the first minor strike that couldn't be repeated in the second one at success. So, um, but but it's a very important question of what is the situation in society. And imagine, as Anna said, there's a global context to that as well. Well, as well, do you can you do you want to come in here? Yeah, um, I, I look back on the history of that time as a whole host of missed opportunities. I think that had the civil rights movement broadened out because I uh, I met friends when I came to Belfast, Protestants that I mixed with for the first time. And um, some of them were in the were, were initially inspired by the civil rights movement because they were living in the same conditions. Many working class Protestants were equally disenfranchised, equally living in poverty. So I think there were missed opportunities. I think if we'd had if we were we're looking back and seeing um, Paddy Devlin and Glenn Barr coming together in a broader movement that broadened out, I think we could have potentially changed how the course of things went. Um, I potentially could have cut across sectarianism. Um, I think it's right, the trade union movement um, has changed because we've lost big industry, we've lost shipbuilding, we've lost manufacturing, a whole host of things have gone that you know we couldn't probably have held on to because of, as things moved on. But I think now um, the trade union movement is too united for us to, to allow that division to come back. I would like to see and, you know, I'd, as I say, I would love that if we still had figures like um, Paddy Devon who could have done it. But uh, if the trade union movement had stepped more into the political arena, um, I would have loved to have seen a, a, a party built on, on the trade union movement, on the working class, on unity. And I think that's what's missing in our politics here because there's no, you know, and I know the PUP to some degree covered or, or, or tried to deal with that. But... The, um, the appeal wasn't broad enough, although there were some Catholics who did join the, the PUP. The appeal wasn't broad enough, but I think that had we had the trade union movement take on the role of building a class based on trade unions, based on workers, I think we could have ourselves now a new, North, a new Northern Ireland Labour Party, not the Starmer type, because who would want that? And when we get rid of the Tories, finally, we're only going to get Tory light, so it's not going to be much better. But I still think there is the there is the potential for a, for a, a workers' movement here and a class movement here and a party that's based on the working class. Thank you, Carmel. Harry, any last last comments in terms of lost opportunities? The the constitutional question will always be a question that will always be a degree of importance uh, to people, but. But the people who will uh, uh, engineer and will carry out the dismemberment of the United Kingdom will be the English Tory party. Uh, for 30 years now, they've had this uh, future dream, and that's good. They call it uh, building Singapore on the Thames. And this will be the opportunity 
I think the processes are already underway, where it's always expensive and always troublesome. Celtic fringe can finally be uh, disengaged uh, uh, with uh, its economics now that's concentrating people's minds. Uh, 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 the, the, the old questions are, 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 are still there, but the state that the finances, uh, uh, I think you said, here uh, uh, are in, I mean, they're, they're, uh, that exposes that day and daily, whether it's the, the teachers, the health workers, what's left of the manufacturing industrial base, I think he says, it, it is, it's, it, it's basically, it's back to the 30s up, 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 uh, again, and uh, hopefully, hopefully, uh, I agree with Carmel, says that uh, positive things can actually come, that, come out of that, if that doesn't sound like a total contradiction, that people are going to be getting it. If you think it was bad before, where do you see what's coming down the road? And it'll be done. It'll be led by the thing that says people, English Tories from the home counties, who always, always look at the bottom line on the balance sheet. Hick also has it spot on, Harry, in terms of you know the, the sense in which there's a political disengagement from the political class of the UK as well, you know, and and that means that there's there's a sense in which th that, so th th even th compared to seventy these nonsense uh, histrionics that go on about uh, Scottish independence, there are plenty of home counties English Tories. He says, but glad to see the back of Scotland. Glad to see the back of this place, of course, um, I think he says. And, uh, well, maybe they may tolerate Wales a bit, but uh, the, uh, 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 I think, I do genuinely believe that that process has been underway, and it, it's not receding in its strength and influence, it's increasing all the time. He says, let's not forget the, 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 uh, the backbone or the, the, the powerhouse that drives uh, the political agenda, he says, for the conserv modern Conservative Party is concentrated where it was always concentrated, going back 350 years, and that's the counties uh, uh, in and around uh, 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 London. And they've already made their mind up. Singapore on the Thames. Uh, the process now is, how do they get there? Thank you, Harry. Jackie, penultimately, any final th thoughts in terms of responding to the gentleman's question in the front? Uh, it's, uh, those days are gone. About, you know, go back to the strike itself, or, or the day where I had 250,000 people protest at the City Hall. No, those days are gone. Uh, unfortunately, unionism isn't what it was then. Unions, because we haven't got what we had then, as far as... Uh, the, the unions were concerned. The loyalist paramilitaries, I, I don't know where they are. You know, not only are the groups more separate in any ways, they're separated within themselves, so there isn't that whole connection anymore. And th th there's friends of mine, people, friends of mine, who really want to get involved, and that's why I have supported Jeffrey. I've had my organs with him in the past, but we need to move on. We need to get storming back and we need to try to get people together. Uh, I always wonder what would have happened. Uh, all the talks about anything that's but we try to bring together uh, in the last 50 years. If there had been no IRA violence, and many of those things might have worked, they had no chance with the background of bombing, murder and mayhem. They had no chance of getting anywhere. And, and the problem for you mentioned earlier about people not what why the, the the UDP or the PUP not make the progress that they made have made. My friend Colin Holiday there, he stood for the UP when he had dark hair back in the day. And his own family said to him, uh, we'll vote for your Colin, but they'll be number two because we always vote for the UP. And that's that's what we're up against. And People, I call it, but Sinn Féin has evolved in this beautiful butterfly, or the IRA has evolved in this beautiful butterfly called Sinn Féin. The people on the nationalist side say they're the ones that fought for us, 
they're the ones that'll talk for us. But within the unionist and loyalist areas, they're the ones that did the fighting, but they're the ones that do the talking. There's the, there's this separation, and we'll never get back to any sort of dominant balance. I hope. But there are people within loyalism and within loyalist paramilitaries who have a contribution to make, particularly by from their experiences, where they don't want to go back to when some other people seem to think that's the way to go. Thank you very much, Jackie. Um, Dawn, if you want to want to close in terms of responding to the gentleman's question there or, or in just in any final thoughts. Mm. Last point, just to reinforce that last point, with Jackie. You know, everyone has to make a contribution to our to our future, and we don't we don't want to exclude anyone from that. But in terms of our politics, sadly, our politics doesn't exist along a left right continuum in Northern Ireland, like it like it does in the rest of the UK. It exists on a green orange continuum, and and many on the orange side tend to be to the right anyway. Um, so I struggle to have someone to vote for in terms of unionism and my type of socialist politics. And I think there is an opportunity for the broad left. I mean, I think, Carmel, you said at one stage, there's something like 140,000 trade unionists that exist in Northern Ireland. Now, that could translate into seats um, either in council or in the Northern Ireland Assembly. Um, and there is a growing number of people, if you look at the rise of the Alliance Party, that people are voting for centre parties, if you like, still not to the left um, in my mind and not somewhere where I want to go to vote for. So there is an opportunity there, I think, for people to vote along left-right lines. We have rejected the, the Northern Ireland Conservatives. I think very clear, nobody wants them. I, I can't see us ever getting um, a Labour branch. Well, we have a Labour branch of the of the English Labour Party, but they're not allowed to to um, stand for election here. Um, the Northern Ireland Labour Party, I think, in its heyday, was something that united Protestant and Catholic. And in fact, two members of the Northern Ireland Labour Party were founder members of the PUP, and and wrote their their first manifesto. And so I think there is an opportunity for the broad left. But I remember talking to people about the broad left and said it's like herding cats, you know, trying to get agreement around around anything. But there's still that opportunity still exists. And I think as as our um, as our devolution matures, as our assembly and executive work better and start to deliver more for people in Northern Ireland, that you will see our politics changing that you won't see the, the, the orange and green conflict and you'll see that dissipating and you'll see a growth of, of normal politics. And that's what I hope for um, in the future. Thank you very much, Dawn, and to all our panellists. And just if we can close with a round of applause for them, please.